All right, in this lab, we are going to take a sample of brass. Brass is an alloy made of copper and zinc. In this form, it's pellets. Um, we're, our job in this experiment is to figure out the percentage of copper that's in a brass sample. We want to do that as a mass percent. So what percentage of the mass of this brass is due to copper? That's the purpose of the experiment. We're going to dissolve the copper in some nitric acid, sorry, the brass in some nitric acid. And from there, we're going to measure absorbance values using spectrophotometry and Beer's law to figure out the percentage of copper in that brass sample. So let's begin by measuring out the brass pellets. Brass pellets are an alloy of copper and zinc metal mixed together and we've got some round pellets here that we use for this experiment. I'm going to put a weighing boat on the balance and zero it, so the balance now ignores the mass of the weighing boat. And what I want is somewhere between 1 and 1.5 grams of the brass pellets. It doesn't matter exactly what the mass is, but we want somewhere between 1 and 1.5 grams. So that looks pretty good. So you want to record that mass. All right, I've got this in a fume hood, so the second uh, digit of the balance is fluctuating a little bit, but there you go. I would record that mass as the mass of the brass pellets. I'm going to take those pellets and transfer them to a small 50 milliliter beaker. So I'll pour my pellets into the beaker. And what we're going to do now is add some concentrated nitric acid. Okay, nitric acid is highly corrosive, especially when it's concentrated. Concentrated acids are saturated. Acids are always dissolved in water, and when they're concentrated, it means that it's a saturated solution of that acid, so it's the highest possible concentration you can have. You want to treat this with caution. That's why I'm wearing rubber gloves today. So I've got a uh, graduated cylinder, 10 milliliter cylinder. I'm going to measure out approximately 5 milliliters of the nitric acid. It doesn't have to be exact. Somewhere 4 to 5 milliliters would be sufficient. So there we go. I've got just around 5 milliliters of the acid in my graduated cylinder. I'll put the cap back on the bottle. We're doing this part of the experiment in the fume hood, which is where you should handle concentrated acids all the time. Um, the fume hood is taking away any dangerous vapors. Now I've got my pellets of brass in the, in the um, beaker here, and I want you to take a look at the reaction that occurs when we add the nitric acid. All right, so I've poured in the acid. You might see an initial green color in the solution. And as the reaction begins, let me just close the balance lid and I'll move that over a bit. So the reaction is very vigorous and it's producing a gas. That reddish-brown gas is nitrogen dioxide gas. As the acid reacts with the brass pellet, it first creates nitrogen monoxide, which then reacts with oxygen in the air to create this reddish-brown toxic nitrogen dioxide gas. It's because of that gas production in part that we're doing this in the fume hood. You can see the vapor being pulled away from me. The reaction is also highly exothermic. When I touch the bottom of the beaker like that, it's very, very hot, okay? And it's producing right now a greenish, bluish solution in the bottom. So there's a color change happening in the solution, and the acid is dissolving the brass pellets right now. So I'm gonna leave that sitting for several minutes. I'll come back to it and take a look. If, when the reaction has died down, there's still some undissolved brass pellets, I'll add a little bit more nitric acid. On the other hand, if the reaction's finished, then we're, we're good. We're going to add some distilled water to it later as well. So there we have it. We've dissolved brass pellets in concentrated nitric acid in a fume hood, and you can see the reaction progressing quite impressively. So the brass has had about 10 minutes to sit in the concentrated nitric acid. I used an excess of acid to ensure that it would dissolve completely. And I've looked inside the beaker. I don't see any evidence of, of undissolved brass pellets. So now we have a solution of dissolved brass. You can see the color is a sort of a turquoise greenish blue color. 
I'm going to take a 100 milliliter volumetric flask. You recall that a volumetric flask has this round shape at the bottom and a narrow a neck at the top. There's one line on the neck of the flask which will measure exactly 100.00 milliliters if the meniscus is brought up to that line. So I'm going to transfer the dissolved brass solution, which has some excess nitric acid in it, into my 100 milliliter volumetric flask. I'm trying to ensure that I don't lose any of the solution on the outside of the beaker or on the outside of the flask. Now there's still some dissolved um, brass in the beaker. I can still see some blue liquid. So I'm going to add some distilled water to that. Now you may recall a safety rule that says when you're adding, mixing water with concentrated acids, there's the A and W rule. Always add acid to the water um, when you're diluting a concentrated acid. In this case, there's very, very little um, acid left in the beaker, so I was safe to add the, uh, the distilled water to that. So now I've got the distilled water, I'll add that to the flask as well. Now you may notice when I add that distilled water, the color of the solution is no longer turquoise. Now it's got this characteristic blue color to it and you may recognize the significance of that. So I'm going to keep adding distilled water. I'll give my beaker one or two more rinses because I want to get all of the dissolved copper, all the dissolved brass rather, out of the beaker. Recall that brass is a alloy of copper and zinc. So I've got three rinses should be good. Now that I've got all of the dissolved brass into the 100 milliliter volumetric flask, I can then add distilled water until the meniscus is just touching the line on the neck of the flask. Now normally you might stop just below the line and then use a pl plastic pipette, but I'm going to risk this and see if I can get this right on. Now you have to be looking at eye level when you're doing this. Okay, so one more drop, one more drop should do it. And actually, yeah, no, that's pretty good. That's right on. So now I'll take the stopper of the flask, stopper it securely, turn it upside down and mix. And I'll do that three times. Just let it breathe. All right. And then this 100 mil volumetric flask now has all of our brass dissolved in it and diluted. All right. So there is our brass solution. Um, it's slightly acidic because of the excess nitric acid, but it's now quite diluted, so it's pretty safe to handle at that point. So we're going to be measuring its absorbance later along with some standard solutions of um, copper. So let's move on. So what we're going to do next is prepare a stock solution, a standard solution of copper 2 nitrate trihydrate. So copper 2 nitrate trihydrate is our solute. Um, it's a blue colored salt. And I'm going to weigh out some of it into a weighing boat on an electronic balance. Just like before, we'll zero the balance to make sure that the um, mass of the weighing boat is not included. And now we're going to add some salt to the weighing boat. When you are weighing, be sure you hold the bottle above the balance so if you spill it spills into the weighing boat. Now I have a preconceived mass of copper nitrate that I would like to weigh out. You're going to want to watch and record the exact mass that I end up using. All right, so I'm getting close to the mass that I want. So I'll slow down a little bit. Whoops, not that slow. There we go. There we go. That's a little tiny bit more than I wanted, so I'm going to just remove a little bit. There you go. That's actually the mass I wanted exactly. So you want to record the mass of the copper 2 nitrate trihydrate that we're using. Now we're going to take that and we're going to transfer it to a 50 milliliter volumetric flask. And we're going to dissolve it in some distilled water. 
Now, just like earlier, a, a volumetric flask has this round base, a narrow neck, and one marking on the neck to measure exactly 50.00 milliliters in this case. So take your weighing boat and carefully transfer quantitatively, so don't spill, the salt to the volumetric flask. Okay? Now you may find that some of the salt sticks to the weighing boat. If that happens, we will add some distilled water to take it out of the weighing boat. All right, so I've got pretty much all of it. There's a little bit on the end. I'll just touch that to my flask. So you can see there's some salt still left in the weighing boat. So let's take some distilled water. I've got a bottle of distilled water here. We're going to be dissolving this in distilled water so we can add some to the weighing boat. And we're going to transfer this also to the 50 milliliter flask. And you may notice there's a bit of salt on the, on the very top of the flask. Maybe I can also wash that down. So we're going to carefully, there we go, don't spill any, add the water to the flask. And one more time, I think I'm going to need to do that because there's still a little bit more salt in the white weighing boat. Nice thing about the white color is you can see any solute still there. So I'm going to add that also. Now there is a tiny, 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 tiny bit of blue left, one little tiny spot. I'm going to ignore that as a small source of error. Now I'm going to continue adding distilled water until the flask is approximately one-third to one-half full. So that's pretty good. I also washed down the neck of the flask to make sure there's no solute there. We'll stopper it. We're going to shake this until it is completely dissolved. But notice as I'm shaking it, I'm doing that in a circular motion. I'm avoiding getting solution up into the neck of the flask. So that may take a few moments, a few minutes perhaps, to dissolve the salt completely. So let me cut away and we'll come back when it's fully dissolved. All right, so it took about a minute of shaking. And now I've looked and the salt is completely dissolved. It's a nitrate salt, copper 2 nitrate. So you may recall that nitrate salts are highly soluble in water, um, but they may not always dissolve quickly. Now I'm going to remove the stopper and I'm going to add more distilled water. Remember on a volumetric flask, there's that one line on the neck that I'm trying to get the meniscus to. So I'm going to add water until the meniscus is just below that line. There you go, it's just below the line. And now I've also got some distilled water in a small beaker with a plastic pipette. So I'm going to take that plastic pipette and I'm going to add the distilled water drop by drop. I'm looking at eye level at the meniscus and I'm going to get it just perfectly touching. One more drop. There we go. It's perfectly touching the neck, the line on the neck of the volumetric flask. So now we can stopper it and we're almost done. Our solution was concentrated at the bottom and that distilled water we just added is up here. I'm going to stopper it, turn it over, see an air bubble up here, shake it, invert it, I'm going to let it breathe. I'm going to do that about three times just to mix the solution. So then it will be homogeneous, It'll, it will be a solution of equal concentration everywhere. So I'm going to do one more time, I'm trying to be careful not to lose any of the solution. One more time. There I go. So there's 50.00 milliliters of a standard, because we will know its concentration, solution of copper 2 nitrate. We were using copper 2 nitrate trihydrate as our solute. All right, so we've got here our standard solution of the copper nitrate that we just prepared. I'm going to take some of that and pour it into a 50 milliliter beaker. I'll fill that up near the top and I'll put the remaining copper nitrate aside. And I've got five test tubes here. What I'm going to do is create five dilutions of this copper nitrate solution. Now what I've decided to do is I'm going to use a glass pipette, a Mohr pipette, M-O-H-R, and I'm going to deliver 
one milliliter of the copper nitrate into the first test tube, three milliliters, five milliliters, seven milliliters, and nine milliliters. So I'm going to use this pipette to put those exact volumes in those five test tubes. Then I'm going to dilute them using distilled water, and I'm going to fill the total volume in each test tube to 10 milliliters total using distilled water. So we're putting one milliliter, three milliliters, five, seven, and nine of our copper nitrate solution. So let's do that. I've got a clean more pipette. I don't need to rinse it out. Um, the pipette is a 10 milliliter pipette. So there's a zero marking at the top and a 10 milliliter marking down here. And it's calibrated so I can use it to deliver any volume I want in between zero and 10 milliliters. I put the pipette on the bottom of the beaker. You can hear it touching. I squeeze the air out of a pipette bulb. There are different devices for using this. We use these bulbs. And I press downwards. While pressing downwards, I never stop pressing down. I'm going to release the grip on my hand slightly, and that will release the pressure in the bulb. And then air pressure is going to push the liquid up the pipette for me. So let me lift the tip of the pipette a little bit off the bottom. And now I'm going to release my, my grip slightly. I'm still pressing down on the bulb. You have to always press down. And now the liquid in the pipette is gone all the way up to here above the zero mark. I take my bulb off, I'll put my, my index finger on top, and now I'm gonna lift it up. I'll take the, the pipette out of the, the copper nitrate solution and hold it like this. I'm looking at eye level, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna release the pressure on my finger at the top of the pipette, and let the meniscus drop until it reaches the zero line. Now if it goes below the zero line, it's not the end of the world, we can start at the one or the two but I've got it exactly at the zero, so I'm gonna to touch the tip of the pipette to the glass to remove any drop on the end. I'll grab my first test tube. Remember, we're gonna put one milliliter in here. So if it's starting with the meniscus at zero, I just need to let it drain from zero to one. So here we go, we let it drain from zero to one. I'm gonna deliberately make a mistake. Oops, it went below one. Well, it's not the end of the world. My second test tube needs three milliliters. So let me go from zero to three, and I can save that mistake. So zero, it's getting very close to three, so I, I put some pressure on my finger. It's now exactly three, so I, I press on the finger to stop the dripping. There's three milliliters of the copper nitrate. Now I'll go back and take the next test tube, and I'll put one milliliter in here. So the meniscus is at three, so to get one milliliter, I'll let it drain from three to four. So let it drain, let it drain, let it drain, and when it gets to the four, perfect, stop and touch any drop to the end, and put, that's one milliliter in there. So I've got one milliliter, three milliliters. I'm going to continue this pipetting, putting five, seven, and nine milliliters of copper nitrate. All right. Finished pipetting the copper nitrate, you can see the levels in the five test tubes increase from one to nine milliliters. So I'll put the copper nitrate solution aside. I have a second beaker that I filled with distilled water. So I'm gonna grab another pipette, a clean pipette, and dry, and I'm gonna use it to add distilled water to the pipettes in the same way. Now I want the total volume in every pipette, sorry, in every test tube to be 10 milliliters. So I'll let you figure out how much water I'm gonna to add to each of the test tubes. All right, so I'll do the first one. Release my grip until the meniscus is above zero. I'll lift the pipette out of the beaker of water. And again, looking at eye level, so you can, you can see the meniscus clearly. Boom, it starts at zero. So now, I'm going to take the first test tube and I'm going to add distilled water until the total volume is 10 milliliters. Again, looking at eye level, my finger is getting ready to stop it. And there I go. Touch a drop that's on the end to the side of the glass and I've just done the first test tube. 
So I'm going to do the same thing with distilled water in the second through fifth test tube. The total volume in every test tube will be 10 milliliters when I'm finished. So what we're going to do next is take a look at some absorption spectra. In this volumetric flask, this 100 mil flask, we have our dissolved brass solution. Now you remember that brass is composed of two metals, an alloy, copper and zinc. And we dissolved brass pellets in nitric acid, concentrated nitric acid. The nitric acid has lots of nitrate ions in it. So in this solution, which is mostly water, we have copper ions floating around, copper 2 plus. We have zinc ions floating around, zinc 2 plus. And we have lots of those nitrate ions floating around, as well as lots of water. So what we're going to do is examine the absorption spectra of two copper solutions, copper sulfate and copper nitrate, as well as two zinc solutions, zinc nitrate and zinc sulfate. Before we do that, let's calibrate our spectral viz spectrophotometer. So we're using a, a, a more advanced device than a normal colorimeter. This device lets us shine light of any wavelength in the visible spectrum through a solution and measure the absorbance of that solution. Now you remember that all of these solutions, including our brass solution, are dissolved in water. So what we want to do first is calibrate the spectrophotometer. So I have a little plastic cuvette. The plastic cuvette is kind of like a test tube, but it has a little lid on it. I have filled this one with distilled water. It has ridges on two sides that I can handle, and it has two sides that are clear where light will pass through. I'd, I'd like to not get any fingerprints and things on there, so don't touch that. I'm going to make sure there's no air bubbles in here. This is distilled water. And over here is my spectral viz spectrophotometer. The little white arrows on there tell me the light travels in this direction inside the device. So when I put in my cuvette, I make sure that the clear sides are lined up with that light path. Now I've got a LabQuest attached to that. I'm going to calibrate the device. When you calibrate a spectrophotometer, the spectral viz, what it's going to want to do first is warm up. And it takes about 90 seconds to warm up, so let's pause and we'll come back when it's finished warming up. All right, so as you may be able to see on the um, computer interface, on the iPad in front of you, the um, screen is now finished warming up and we're ready to finish the calibration. So we just have to tap the finish calibration button. And now what's happening is the SpectroViz and the, com and the computer are ig ignoring the absorbance of distilled water. So at this point, they're gonna treat the distilled water as having a zero absorbance. And now that we're done, we can press OK to go back to the main screen, and we're ready to run full spectra of various samples. Now ideally, you would use the same cuvette that you calibrated with when you're measuring any, any absorbance values, but for the sake of simplicity, we're gonna use different cuvettes. They're all clean and new. There's no scratches, no smudges, so any, any error should be very minimal. Now let's start with the copper sulfate solution. So I've got a blue colored solution. I'm not sure if you can see that, but there's a blue colored solution of copper sulfate. Its concentration is 0.1 molar. Technically it's copper 2 sulfate, but I'll just say copper sulfate. I put it in the SpectroViz spectrophotometer, again with the clear sides lined up with the light path. And on my computer interface, I press collect, and now it's going to display the absorption spectrum on the screen. I'll stop that, and now you can see the spectrum. Um, you can see, I hope, in the screen that the absorbance, actually, let me, let me rescale this. I'll change the scale to make it a little bit easier for you to see. All right, I've rescaled the graph so you can see it a bit more clearly. The y-axis for absorbance, if you want to sketch this spectrum, this again is copper 2 sulfates spectrum, it goes from 0 to 1.5 absorbance value. Um, this was a 0 0.1 molar solution. I've set the wavelength scale, this is a graph of absorbance versus wavelengths in nanometers, to go from 400 nanometers up to 850 nanometers. Now 850 is a little bit outside of the visible spectrum, 
the visible spectrum runs from about 400 to about 750 nanometers, which is where the red ends in that, in that rainbow. Now this is copper to sulfate. You can see that the absorbance values are essentially zero all the way through the, from 400, all the way through the blues and the greens, and then it starts to creep up and it goes all the way up to a maximum absorbance value at about 820 nanometers. That 820 nanometers would be in the infrared region of the spectrum, just outside the red region of the visible spectrum. So that's copper to sulfate's absorption spectrum. Let's take the copper to sulfate out of the spectral viz, and we'll put in copper to nitrate. The reason we're doing this is because the copper sulfate solution has copper ions and sulfate ions floating around in it. I wonder what it is that's causing this absorption spectrum. Here we have copper to nitrate. So here is copper to plus ions and nitrate ions floating around in the distilled water. Now remember we calibrated for distilled water so the device is ignoring any absorbance of distilled water. So on my computer interface I'll now start collecting again and I'll tell it to ignore the old data. So there we go, it's going to ignore the old data. It'll collect a new absorption spectrum. Now this one's going a little bit higher in absorbance value, but I'll now stop. And there is our spectrum for copper to nitrate. Now the absorbance value depends a little bit on concentration, so there may be a little bit of a difference in the concentrations, but they're both approximately 0.1 molar. Now in this spectrum, how does it compare to the spectrum for copper to sulfate? Well, it shows again zero absorbance values in the blues and greens, and then it starts to go all the way up again, and it reaches a maximum absorbance a little bit off the scale here, a little bit above 1.5 units. But the more important thing is the wavelength now is around 810 nanometers, very close to the wavelength of maximum absorption of the copper to sulfate. So I'll let you think about what it is that's causing the spectrum. Is it the copper ions? Is it the sulfate ions? Is it the nitrate ions? What's causing the absorption spectrum based on what you've seen so far? Now you remember that brass contains not only copper, but also zinc. So let's repeat this for two more spectra. We'll look at zinc nitrate and zinc sulfate also. So I'll take the copper salt nitrate out of the spectroviz. I'll replace it with copper nitrate this time. Sorry, zinc nitrate. So I put it in again so that the light is traveling through the clear sides. I'll press collect on my device and discard the old data. And now we're going to look at the spectrum for zinc nitrate. I'll stop collecting data. And what do you see in the absorption spectrum? Well, the absorption spectrum shows an absorbance of pretty much zero for the entire range of the wavelengths. So between 400 and 850 nanometers, the entire visible spectrum, the absorption of the zinc solution, the zinc nitrate solution, is zero. So nothing in that solution appears to be absorbing light. Now I wonder if there's something about the color of that solution which might reinforce that idea. Let's take out the zinc nitrate and we'll replace it with one more, this time the zinc sulfate. Again, I've wiped off the cuvettes to make sure there's no fingerprints and smudges, they're dry. Am I putting them in the, with the light traveling through clear sides? Let's collect another set of data, discard the previous spectrum. There we go. And here is the absorption spectrum of zinc sulfate. It's finished recording, so we'll stop. And there it is. How does the zinc sulfate absorption spectrum compare with the zinc nitrate, the one we just saw? So again, the absorption values are pretty much zero through the entire spectrum from 400 to 850 nanometers. So now we've seen that solutions that contain zinc ions and sulfate ions, zinc ions and nitrate ions had a certain absorption spectrum. Solutions that had copper ions and sulfate ions, copper ions and nitrate ions, they had a different spectrum. Can you tell from these absorption spectra 
which ion it is in the solutions that is creating good absorbance in the visible spectrum. I'll let you think about that. All right, so I've replaced the um, copper nitrate um, cuvette into the spectrobiz and just run its spectrum one more time. Remember the solutions that we, are, that we prepared earlier were copper to nitrate solutions. So now on my, on my LabQuest interface, you can see it here on the screen, I'm gonna change the mode of the experiment from a full spectrum measurement to an events or maybe a time-based entry is what I'll do. So I'll press OK. I'll discard my previous data. And you'll notice that automatically the, the computer is going to measure the absorbance values at the wavelength of maximum absorbance, which we call lambda max. Lambda max for copper nitrate was a little bit outside the visible spectrum. So we're using 820 nanometers as our, absor as our um, wavelength. If you were using a colorimeter, you might use a, um, a wavelength closest to this. So in the colorimeter, you only have four choices for wavelengths. You would use the wavelength that was closest to 820 nanometers. Now this absorbance value is pretty high. It's 1.5. For Beer's Law analysis, which we're going to do with these standard solutions, we'd like absorbance values to be uh, not, not too high. This is actually probably okay, but let me take the most concentrated solution of our, of our copper nitrate, and we're gonna measure its absorbance at this wavelength and decide if we should change that wavelength. All right, I've taken our five test tube solutions and I've filled up five cuvettes. Again, these are clean cuvettes. Ideally, we'd be using the same cuvette, so that's a tiny source of error. I'm gonna just check to see what the absorbance reading is for the most concentrated copper nitrate solution, our last one, I'm going to put it in the color in the spectroviz. If the absorbance value is too high, then we need to reduce the wavelength. We can't. We may not be able to use lambda max. So for Beer's law analysis, we want a wavelength value that is, oh, sorry, an absorbance value that is less than two units. Ideally, somewhere around 1.5 units or lower would be good. So I'm going to need to change the wavelength on our spectroviz. So let me tap, whoops, I can't do it on there. I'll tap on my computer interface. I'm gonna change the wavelength of light that we shine through it. And I'm gonna go back to the visible region of the spectrum. Let me change this to about 650 nanometers, which is still very close to lambda max. It's, it's close to it. Let's see what the absorbance value here is. So now the absorbance is about 1.5 units and these other solutions, which are less concentrated, would have absorbance values less than that. So I think I'm going to be good with this as my wavelength. So we're going to use, instead of the lambda max, we're going to use something with, which is close to lambda max, 650 nanometers, which is kind of like one of the choices on a colorimeter. All right, so now I'll take that cuvette out, now that we've chosen the wavelength that we're going to use. Now let's just quickly review Beer's Law. Beer's law talks about how the absorbance of colored solutions depends on two factors. The absorbance depends on the distance the light travels through a solution. You can see that if you look at a volumetric flask sometimes. Remember, it's wider here at the bottom, so when I look through the bottom, I can see that it looks darker. It's narrower up here in the neck of the flask, and when I look through there, it looks lighter. So why does it look darker down here and lighter up here? The reason is that the distance that the light travels through a solution affects the amount of light absorbed. This is part of the Beer-Lambert law, which is often just called Beer's law. The far, the greater the distance, the more light is absorbed and the less light is transmitted. If more light is absorbed and less light transmitted, it looks darker. Up here, there's a shorter path length, a shorter distance for light to travel, so therefore less light is being absorbed, more light is transmitted, and it looks lighter. So the distance that the light travels through a solution is one of the two variables that affects the absorbance values for a colored solution. The other factor is the concentration of the solution. You can probably see that just looking at these five cuvettes. 
the, the one with the lowest concentration, it had the least amount of our copper nitrate solution, is the lightest in color. The one that is got the most, the highest concentration, it had the greatest amount of copper nitrate, is much darker in color. So the absorbance is higher in the, in the more concentrated solution, it's lower in the less concentrated solution. So concentration of the solution is the second variable that affects the absorbance. Beer's law is usually written as absorbance equals a constant, usually the Greek letter epsilon, and it's often referred to as the molar absorptivity. So a constant times the path length, the distance the light travels, and that's usually given the letter B in the formula, times the concentration of the solution, and that's usually given the letter C. So Beer's law usually looks like A equals EBC. In these cuvettes, the diameter of the cuvette is 1.00 centimeters. So for us, the value of the path length, B, is one centimeter. And that means that Beer's law simplifies because if B is equal to one, then his equation simply reduces to absorbance will equal EC. And that means the absorbance is directly proportional to the concentrations. So what we're gonna do is measure the concentration of the absorbance values of these five cuvettes. You'll be able to calculate their concentrations because you know the volumes that I used to prepare the test tubes. You saw the mass of copper nitrate that I used to make my original 50 milliliter solution of copper nitrate. So you know the concentration of the original copper nitrate solution. You can do dilution calculations to find the concentration of copper nitrate in each of those test tubes. Then we'll measure their absorbances and you can create a graph of absorbance versus concentration. So let's take some absorbance readings. I'm gonna start with the least concentrated cuvette. I'll slide that in the spectroviz. You can record the absorbance value that you see when it stabilizes. This is at 650 nanometers. Now we'll take the second solution of our standard solutions. And again, when I put them in, I'm making sure the light travels through the clear edges of the cuvette. And none of the cuvettes have air bubbles. They've all been wiped clean and dry. So there's the absorbance of the second solution. Our third test tube's absorbance value. Wait for it to stabilize and record the value you see. Our fourth test tube's absorbance value. You can see the absorbance values are increasing as the concentration increases, which is what we expected. And then the last standard solutions absorbance value, there it is. All right, so you've recorded the absorbances of our five solutions. From that, you can create your Beer's Law plot. It should create a linear graph, and you'll get the equation of the line of best fit on that graph. Now remember, earlier we dissolved a brass sample. We measured its mass, and you recorded that in nitric acid. Then we transferred it to a 100 mL volumetric flask, and now this 100 mL solution has all of the dissolved brass in it. So there's copper ions floating in here, there's zinc ions floating in here, there's nitrate ions floating in here. I'm gonna transfer some of the brass solution to a beaker, clean, dry beaker. And then I'm gonna fill a sixth cuvette with the brass solution. I'll cap it, put a little lid on just in case I were to spill it. I'll grab a Kim wipe tissue. I'll dry off the cuvette, make sure there's no fingerprints or air bubbles. And now let's measure its absorbance value. So here's the absorbance value of our brass solution. Just from this absorbance value, you can probably get a sense of where it fits compared to our standard solutions. You're gonna take this absorbance value of the brass solution and use it to calculate the concentration of copper in the brass solution. If you know the concentration of copper, 
and the volume of the solution that we had prepared, you can get the moles of copper. And then from there, you can figure out the mass of copper and the mass percent of copper that was in our brass sample. And that's the purpose of this experiment, to find the percentage of copper in a brass sample.